All right. Hello, everybody. A very, very warm welcome to you all here today, live from COP26 here in gorgeous Glasgow. Happy Nature Day to everyone. Today is Nature Day as part of the COP26 presidency program. It's so fantastic to have everyone here today rallying around the theme of nature here at the Climate Change COP. I want to say that it's so great to have speakers and audience here both physically and virtually. We have all of our speakers here with us in person today, but we have a fantastic set of audience members from all over the world joining us here for this event. I know that I have a contingent watching from Australia, where I'm from. We also have uh, audience members listening in from Africa, from parts of Asia, from the UK and Europe as well. And for us, it's really fantastic not only to be able to take this event to the world, but to also bring the world into this event here at COP26. So it's really fantastic and I very much thank the um, the Race to Resilience, the High Level Champions who have brought together the Resilience Hub to enable this and very much also thank the support crew and the tech crew that are bringing this together today. So, on behalf of TRIAID, Farm Africa, my organisation, the International Institute for Environment and Development, it is my absolute pleasure and honour to moderate today's, today's session on stories from the front line, how to ensure nature-based solutions deliver for people as well as for nature and climate. If we could get the slides up um, when ready, that would be absolutely marvellous. Some light housekeeping. As I mentioned, we've got both a physical and virtual audience at the moment. Those who are engaging virtually, if you are on the Gigawox platform, you'll be able to ask questions and you'll be able to chat amongst yourselves. So please very much do that. We'll have some time for questions and answers at the end and we'll take questions both from the floor here in person but also through the virtual world. So please do engage virtually if you're joining us from around the world today. If I could go to the next slide, thank you very much. So really what we're doing today is exploring the power of nature and we're going to do that through three case studies looking at high quality nature based solutions that are delivering for climate, nature and people on the ground. Drawing from a major nature based, nature -based solutions report that was released earlier this year um, through Bond and in partnership with 14 environment and development organisations. Um, I'll go through that report shortly in a moment, but that really is the kind of framing for this discussion today. And the three case studies that you'll hear from are directly taken from that report and are directly here today to talk to you about the different case studies that they will be showcasing. We'll move through our event today in three parts. First, we'll talk about why high quality nature-based solutions, why is it important and what is it? We'll then launch straight into the kind of main discussion today, which is looking at the three case studies of high quality nature-based solutions from Mali, from China, and from Ethiopia. And then we'll end our session today with a policy discussion, and we're very thrilled to have someone from the Adaptation Fund here to help us with that as well. And we'll start to have a bit more of a policy discussion around what it means to scale up nature-based solutions and also to finance it. So that is our agenda for the next 90 minutes or so. What I would like to do first is to play a song from a youth choir who were due to be with us in person today but unfortunately had a scheduling clash because um, they're very popular and very busy. Um, so what they have um, allowed us to do is to play a song from them which is a collaboration that they have done with West Papuan children um, down in the Pacific. So if we could have the first song please, it's called It's a Time to Heal. It was new. The sun still sets and rises on a world of green and blue. Woods and oceans, plants and streams. A beauty that is stunning in its wild variety. Open your eyes, open your heart. Something to love
The sun still sets and rises up A future we can choose Thank you very much. And just again, a huge thanks to the choir for allowing us to play that today. Really talking about the future we choose and the decisions we make today here at COP26 will really pave our pathway for the future. So very powerful stuff there. I want to um, now turn to introduce you all to the Nature Based Solutions Report that is grounding our event today. Um, we know very much so that the world is facing a triple emergency of climate change, of loss of nature and of rising inequality and poverty. We won't go through the statistics, we don't have a lot of time, but we do know that more than half of global GDP is highly or moderately dependent on nature and that many parts of the world, particularly in poorer parts, rely on nature for food, for medicine, for shelter, etc. And so it's really critical that we're having this discussion here today on nature at Nature Day. What's really important um, and what there is growing awareness of is the need to ensure that we are looking at holistic solutions that seek to tackle the triple emergency. So rather than addressing climate change in one, on one hand and addressing biodiversity on the other hand, really looking at solutions that can bring all of this together and tackle it in a really holistic way. Um, and this is really what this report is about. This is about showcasing nature-based solutions. This is about showcasing how the power of nature can really deliver for climate, and nature and people. And so we really wanted to have some time, have some space here at COP26 to bring these three case studies, well, there are 13 in the report, but to bring three of the case studies in particular to life to have that space to discuss it today at COP26. I do just want to frame things a little bit um, for how we talk about nature-based solutions. And I think it's really important to note that when tackling the triple crisis, certainly from our perspective, there's no silver bullet. We're not suggesting that nature-based solutions alone will solve the world's problems, but they are a really substantial tool that we have available to contribute towards pos positive progress. Um, and I think it's also worth really emphasising that the power of nature needs to be matched with the knowledge and experience of local peoples and indigenous, uh, and indigenous peoples and local communities and really bringing in the traditional knowledge, really bringing in their culture, their experience gained over centuries is absolutely essential to tackling the triple crisis as well. So the case studies you'll see today absolutely demonstrate that and it's fantastic that we can, we can have that here today. So as I said, the report itself, we launched it back in June this year. It's a collaboration between 15 environment and development organisations and I can see a number of us here in the room that have been directly involved in the report. It's great to see you all. Um, and really these 15 organisations came together on a shared recognition of the need to show the, the role of nature in tackling the triple emergency. The reason that we've released it this year is because this is the 2021 super year. This is the year of COP26, which we're at right now. This is a year when COP15, the Convention on Biological Diversity, has started. This is a year when the G7 and the G20 are talking about nature and climate change. And so having a report of this nature, having the evidence base there for decision makers, helps to move those discussions forward. Um, I won't talk too much about the report because I actually think the, sh the case studies that we'll, we'll have for everyone today uh, speak for themselves in terms of what the report shows. If you could just move to the next slide as well, that would be fantastic. But just to point out that there are 13 case studies shown in the report from across the world, um, as you can see on the map there in front of you. Um, there are a couple of aspects to the report that I think are worth highlighting in the context of today. The report has seven policy recommendations um, and also seven common success factors or enabling factors that we have um, derived from the case studies themselves. And there are two that are important to recognise as we move through the discussion today. The first is the importance of supporting and involving local communities and Indigenous peoples to champion and lead nature and culture-based solutions, really drawing on their deep cultural connections and effective stewardship of nature. And many of the case studies show this in the report. The second is the need to ensure that long-term predictable and patient financing that gets down to the local level is really essential. It's not just about delivering money at the local level for projects. It's about involving local people, involving local communities, giving them power and influence over the actual use of the money itself and the direction of program, uh, the direction of the project is incredibly important. 
Um, so I think I perhaps will not keep talking about the report. I could talk about it for the whole hour and a half, but I won't. Um, we have also seen some very substantial COP26 announcements come out. So there's been the Glasgow Declaration on Forest and Land Use. There's been the $12 billion um, Global Forest Finance Pledge. There's been joint statements that have been signed around these issues. And this is all, from my perspective at least, very welcome. But the devil is in the detail and the implementation. And Sheila Patel, who many of you will know, um, who's a global ambassador for the Race to Resilience, said earlier in the week that judgment on the effectiveness of these projects will come from the front line. It will be the indigenous peoples, the local communities that really are the judge of how effective these programs and announcements have been. So with that, I would like to now hand over to Professor Natalie Seddon who is going to come up and talk to us a little bit more about nature-based solutions, take us through the guidelines um, for what good quality nature-based solutions look like. So Nat, if you could come up and I'll just properly introduce you and next slide please as well. So Nat Seddon, Professor Nat Seddon is um, a Professor of Biodiversity at the University of Oxford here in the UK and also my hometown here in the UK. She's the founding director of the Nature Based Solutions Initiative at Oxford and co-lead of the Biodiversity and Society program at the Oxford Martin School. So Nat, over to you to take us away. Thank you very much um, and thanks for the opportunity to take part in this. I have to say I'm, I'm uh, it was an amazing film that we just saw now and um, you know in the words of those those incredible children nature is a is a work of art but nature is also our life support system and that's what's at the basis of this idea of a nature-based solution it's rooted in the understanding from local knowledge from indigenous communities and also from science that healthy functional ecosystems support human communities in countless ways we can name some of them fresh water, food, food security, pollination services, disaster risk reduction, all these different benefits, livelihood support, they can also, if properly implemented, help us cool um, the planet. So nature-based solutions as a concept, if we can have the next slide, please, also arises from our understanding that biodiversity loss and climate change share some of the same drivers and hence share some of the same solutions. So we know that on land, for example, um, land use change to industrial agriculture is the biggest driver of biodiversity declines. Meanwhile, it's the second biggest um, source of greenhouse gas emissions. So in theory, by enhancing our carbon stores, the careful stewardship of our ecosystems, we can also help stem the tide of biodiversity loss while providing multiple benefits for people all over the world along the way. So, um, put very simply though, let's get to definitions because there is actually quite a lot of confusion about what counts as a nature-based solutions and lots of projects have been badged or rebadged as a nature-based solutions that they might not actually count. So put very simply, I mean, it involves ways of working with nature to support societal challenges. Um, they involve protecting, restoring, and connecting. And connecting is a very important word, I think, to remember in the context of nature-based solutions. A wide range of ecosystems, not only on the land, but also in the oceans and our coastal ecosystems. So not just forests, but many different sorts of ecosystems. They involve regeneration of our working lands and our, on our aquatic systems, our crop plans, our timberlands and so forth and that's vitally important to remember and they also can involve um, bringing well greening our cities bringing green and blue infrastructure into our cities so those are very broadly speaking you know the broad types of actions involved and we're going to hear a lot more in the case studies about what that really means on the ground so as a result of growing evidence from science and from practice and awareness, you know, nature-based solutions have skyrocketed up um, government and um, policy business agendas as well. Um, and indeed, if we can have the next slide, you know, we do need to implement nature-based solutions across the world if we are to meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. You know, properly implemented, um, carefully implemented, working with local communities, nature-based solutions can really enhance our resilience to the effects of climate change, enhance our adaptive capacity, whilst also contributing to cooling towards the end of the century. Um, but poorly designed schemes, if we can have the next slide please, poorly designed schemes can have um, negative outcomes and there are quite rightly m many concerns about such schemes, in particular that they are being used in greenwashing, 
um, that in other words high polluting entities are investing or claiming to invest in nature based so called nature based solutions rather than actually getting on with decarbonizing their operations and I'll return to that another problem with nature-based solutions um, can be an overemphasis on tree planting. There are issues around the permanence of some of these plantations, the permanence of the carbon stored within them. Talk about that in a minute. There's also potentially Im adverse impacts on biodiversity if those um, tree plantations, for example, replace biodiverse, uh, carbon-rich ecosystems, and there can be very biodiverse outcomes for local communities if they're poorly implemented. And again, I want to return to all these um, shortly. So, you know, as nations and businesses start to invest in and integrate nature-based solutions as part of their approach to dealing with the climate change and biodiversity crises, so it's vital that we have some robust guidelines. Can we have the next slide, please? robust guidelines to guide those investments about what good looks like, um, you know, to have some alignment there. And so a group of uh, conservation and development organizations together with a wide range of um, research organizations, initially from the UK as part of a letter that was sent to uh, Alok Sharma when the news of his presidency of COP26 was announced. But then this has grown to incorporate organizations from all over the world, got together to put together these four broad guidelines about what successful, sustainable nature-based solutions look like. Um, so if we can have the next slide. And the first critical guideline is that nature-based solutions are, are not a substitute for the rapid phase-out of fossil fuel use and must not distract from or delay urgent action to decarbonize the economy. So if we can have the next slide, please. You know, um, nature-based solutions play a critical role, and according to this recent study that I was involved with, and in fact the lead author is in the audience, Cecile Girardin, showed that if we scale up nature-based solutions to the maximum extent possible on land, that can deliver a global mitigation potential of around 10 gigatons of carbon dioxide per year. And that this translates into around 0.3 of a degree off peak warming towards the end of the century. Now this is a substantial and important contribution to global cooling. And that needs to be recognized and acknowledged, but it's also much smaller than one must, that one must be achieved through the decarbonization of our economy. Because what the science is very clear on is if we don't keep fossil fuels in the ground, then the resultant warming will turn the biosphere, will turn our ecosystems into a net source of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases. Um, it will turn them through the intensity, and high intensity and frequency of fires, for example, releases all that carbon. So it means essential that we keep that carbon locked up in the biosphere. So we do need to scale up investment in nature-based solutions. We do need to defund the destruction of our ecosystems, but we also need to decarbonize the economy. So that's number one. So what this speaks to is a need to vet the investors in nature-based solutions. We need to make sure that they are investing in nature-based solutions as well as um, doing everything they possibly can to remove or reduce fossil fuel use from their supply chains and so forth. So the next slide, please. The second guideline um, is that nature-based solutions involve um, a wide range of ecosystems on land and in the sea. There's been a tendency over the years to focus on forests for various reasons. Forests are very important ecosystems, particularly intact old growth forests around the world. They are very resilient to the effects of climate change and very effective at sequestering and storing carbon. But so are a wide range of other ecosystems, peatlands, salt marshes, um, seagrass meadows, um, mangrove forests, are, are, of course, coral reefs, and all these other diverse ecosystems. And we must ensure that those are adequately protected and sustainably restored. Um, so the next slide, please. So, um, no, well, first of all, before I go on to the next slide, I just want to highlight that this um, the tendency to focus on forestation, or particularly afforestation, which is a term that refers to planting trees in areas where trees don't naturally grow. Um, focusing on that as a climate solution is a problem, first of all, because plantations, because they're usually low diversity, they usually don't contain very many species, often only one, um, they are not resilient to the impacts of climate change, new diseases, warming and so forth. They tend to be very vulnerable to forest fires, for example. So they're very sh often very high risk carbon stores. And in some cases, those plantations are used for wood products that we need, but may that have short life um, spans. Um, and as I say, the, the other problem, as I've mentioned, that they can distract from the need to protect our intact ecosystems. Next slide, please. 
So the third um, key critical guideline, which has already been referred to and explained very eloquently by Ebony, is that nature-based solutions are designed and implemented, managed and monitored by or in very close partnership with indigenous peoples and local communities, with farmers, with community groups and, and so on, through a process that fully respects and champions their local rights, knowledge and, gener and gen critically generates local benefits for those people in terms of livelihood, disaster risk reduction and all these other benefits. And the problem is in the areas where regulatory frameworks are weak and land is easily appropriated, often those rights and also that knowledge, local knowledge, are ignored or violated. And as we've heard at many sessions, it's just been wonderful to hear that it's often often the indigenous people and local communities that have the best knowledge about how to work with nature. So not only is it unethical to ignore local people and indigenous communities, it also means that those nature-based solutions won't be sustainable for the long term. They won't actually deliver what they need to deliver on, whether for climate, for nature, or for the communities themselves. Um, next slide, please. Um, so there are examples of this all over the world of bad nature-based solutions. Today we're going to be focusing on what good nature-based solutions look like, but it's also worth just bearing in mind what bad can and often does look like. So for example, this is a, um, a concession that was established in um, pristine lowland old growth tropical forest in Cambodia, which was established, it was a, a monoculture plantation that was established in an area that was really rich in biodiversity that had um, local indigenous peoples that were dependent upon it. It was replaced by this acacia monoculture, local communities were dispossessed and it was actually a net loss for carbon and biodiversity. So this, we don't want this. <laughs> we need to do everything we can to stop this happening all over the world. Okay, next slide, please. And finally, we need to remember that biodiversity, as well as being an outcome of a good nature, the supporting of biodiversity being a out good outcome of nature-based solutions, it is a foundational property. Biodiversity is that which gives our ecosystems their resilience. It's that which secures the flow of all these multiple benefits. So um, we need to ensure that those nature-based solutions support or enhance the native biodiversity, that wide diversity of species. Otherwise, again, these ecosystems won't be resilient in a warming world. So final slide. Um, and this is an example of um, a, a monoculture plantation that replaced um, old growth um, forest in Chile and had a net loss, again, for carbon and biodiversity. Okay, next slide, please. So um, we currently have around 43 signatures of these guidelines. As again, these are signatories that have real expertise in, in um, the effectiveness of nature-based solutions, so conservation, development, and research organization. But if you are one of those organizations, and if what we've talked about today across these four guidelines makes sense to you and you would like to become a signatory, then please let me know. Next slide, please. Um, so today, um, as it's Nature Day, I just wanted to highlight the fact that although this is a, um, an event looking at um, nature-based solutions from other parts of the world, we're also doing some nat implementing nature-based solutions in the UK. Um, and so we're launching three films on what's going on in the UK around nature-based solutions. We've also uh, released two policy briefs on nature-based solutions for climate change adaptation in the global south, um, very relevant to the discussions here today. And the last slide, please. And um, the case studies that are in the, the report um, that Ebony was talking about at the beginning also feature on this global interactive platform for nature-based solutions. So this is a platform that we'll be rele releasing in the UN Pavilion on Monday, where you can sp explore different case studies of best practice nature-based solutions from all around the world. And this is a resource that is going to be growing um, over time. So I'll leave it there. Thank you very much for your attention. It's a pleasure to be here today. Thank you so much, Nat. It's always so great to hear from you, to hear about the four guidelines and just particularly hearing your emphasis on, you know, nature is not the silver bullet. We need to continue to pursue the use of nature in these, in these challenges, but also while we're rapidly decarbonizing our economy as well. So thank you very much for your time today, Nat. That concludes the first part of today's event. We're now going to move into the case study component. Um, we have three case studies from Ethiopia, from China, from Mali. So we're going on a worldwide tour today. And it honestly gives me such great pleasure to introduce and bring up our first two speakers for the first case study. So if I could ask Noura Aman, a program manager, and Yvonne Bayot, a senior associate from Farm Africa, to come up and to deliver the first case study from Ethiopia. They'll have uh, 12 minutes to deliver the presentation. I'll give a two-minute um, warning, and then we'll have a bit of a discussion.
Thanks so much, Nora. <clears throat> okay, thank you so much. Uh, I'm going to present lessons from Farm Africa uh, for the long-term presentation in the Bali ecoregion in Ethiopia. Uh, next, next, please. Yeah, uh, so uh, we were actually in, in implementing in the in, in Bali ecoregion. Uh, let me talk a, a bit, a uh, little about the Bali ecoregion. Uh, as you can see on the map, uh, the second green area is is a, is a Bali ecoregion, uh, and you can see at, at the right uh, the map in, in in this area. It is one of the uh, ecological, socio-economic, and cultural and ecological important area. It, it, it comprises diverse ecosystem in the forest type, and it also hosts the uh, Harana forest, one of the uh, largest Afro-alpine habitat in Africa. Uh, and also it is one of the second major uh, biodiversity reach in the tropical forest uh, block in, in, in Ethiopia, and, and it is really uh, the area that uh, has the significant uh, biodiversity, and it is also one of the birthplace of the uh, Kofi Arabica, and the center of the biodiversity of the Kofi Arabica, and it is also one of the 34 globally, uh, uh, bio, globally biodiverse hotspot areas and it hosts more than 1.6 million people in this ecoregion and also we have more than 12 million uh, people living in the downstream of this area and that is why actually we have been implementing our program in this very critical and very important biodiversity uh, hotspot areas. Uh, Farm Africa, mobilizing the community uh, and coordinating with the government. Next, please. Uh, so, how people are actually making lives in these very important ecosystems, especially the globally important uh, biodiversity host hotspot areas. So, basically, we have three uh, major livelihood systems in the highland, a kind of mixed crops, and also the uh, forest product and uh, the uh, uh, livestock production. And also we have uh, the mid altitude, uh, the livelihood system majorly based on the crop production. And also we have the lowland, predominantly based on the livestock production. Next, please. Uh, this is a typical example of the high altitude livelihood systems in that areas. A mixed crop, forest product, and livestock production. Next, please. And this is a typical example for the mid-altitude livelihood systems in that ecoregion, dominated by the crop production. Next, please. Next slide. Yeah, this is a typical example for the lowland areas predominantly uh, livestock production. Next slide, please. Yeah, this is the eco uh, region, which is really under risk. And it is, it is one of the, as I said, it is one of the 34 uh, biodiversity rich hotspot areas. And, and we really, we have been doing a lot to preserve and, and protect these very important biodiversity rich areas. So what, what, has, what we have been doing here? Next, please. Yeah, we were actually managing uh, three things here, increasing the value of the forest, including establishing participatory forest management. We have a number of uh, participatory forest management cooperatives we established there, managing their own forest in collaboration with the government. And also we have the RED, the payment for ecosystem service. And also we have the sustainable timber and the bamboo value chain. And the second one is reducing the, the, the need to expand for the, far, for, for the farmland. Especially we were 
majorly focusing on participatory rangeland management, animal breeding, forage development, health in the water facilities, and also enhancing the crop productivity and the resilience. And the third one is actually we were focusing on an integrated landscape management, which is more wide approach, uh, comprising protected area management, watershed management, and uh, payment for ecosystem service, and reducing the consumption, the fuel wood consumption by the local community. Next slide, please. So what, what was the impact that we really bring in terms of the people, climate, and the nature being there for, for the last uh, two decades? So we were actually increase uh, in livestock and the crop production and diversify the livelihood of the uh, local community living there. Uh, we were actually uh, working on the non-timber forest product and we substantially enhanced their income and, and also we in, in, in 35 percent increase in the dietary score and access to safe water for the people. Uh, on, on climate as well, we have been working on the climate resilient crop varieties and also on the livestock breed improvement and water access. And also we were working on the weather and hydrological monitoring. We dramatically, drastically reduced the deforestation of that ecoregion by 62%. And also we were reduced the uh, fuel wood consumption by 50% actually saving uh, more than 11,000 metric cube per year. And with regard to the nature, in fact, now we have about 500,000 hectares under the participatory forest management, and also we have about 350,000 hectares under the participatory uh, land use plants. And we have more than one meter high trees in the core forest area, up from 64 uh, to uh, 79 uh, trees. And we have, of course, uh, 38,528 hectares under the community uh, controlled uh, hunting region. And as a result of red, uh, during the period from, 20 to 20, to, from 2012 to 2015, we were managed to save about 12,496 hectares, and as a result, we minimize the emission of 5.5 million tons of carbon dioxide, and also during 2016 to 2020, we were managed to save 12,637 hectares of land. As a result, we really managed to minimize the emission of 6 million tons of carbon dioxide. And of course, we enhanced the livelihood of the people from the non-timber for forest product, including the uh, coffee, honey, and the others. So uh, with this, I would like to thank you and uh, stop here and uh, invite Yvan to present the next slide. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Nora. And, um, uh, thank you um, to to share Farm Africa's journey um, and and your journey uh, in in the Bali uh, eco region. It's a it's it's a journey that has taken a long time for Farm Africa. It's more than 20 years journey, and it is a journey that um, I I believe and I think you will agree with me has achieved many benefits to both nature and people. But it's also a journey that has allowed us in, in headquarters in Farm Africa to learn some lessons about what might help us um, in, in making sure that efforts like these are, are, have a bigger chance of being effective. Um, and, and, and I'd like to share some of those lessons with you here. Um, and the first one is, of course, and you know all of this, this is what, what everybody gets taught at uni, you have to, you have to really look at these nature-based solutions, not as just a number of trees you can plant on land, but you have to look at this within, within complex systems, within the household systems. You look at it within the farming system. You look at it within 
the catchment, uh, you look at it um, within the food system. Um, so, so this is a first lesson that we learned, and that is that in as far as we consider nature-focused impact or, or inputs, or any other input for that matter, as long as we consider this within a system, we have a grander chance, a greater chance of success than if we don't. The second one, of course, is working with communities, and this, this we, of course, know as well. And what does this mean? It means that we work only as far as communities allow us to work. And it also means working only as fast as what communities allow us um, to, to achieve. It means that we have to work at the pace and under the direction of the communities and not the other way around. It also means, and this is maybe one of the hallmarks of, of Farm Africa, it means engaging markets. Um, Engaging markets uh, means, means building business capacity in communities. It means making sure communities can talk and work with traders. It means enhancing access to finance uh, so that products, uh, non-timber forest products, and sometimes even timber, can be marketed within, within market systems. Um, and this is an important element. And our success in coffee um, is very much based on having put a lot of emphasis not on developing the production of coffee but on actually working the value chain and working with the New York buyers for this high quality coffee. Finally, but perhaps most importantly, it is the fact that we have worked very, very closely with Kaufman. Um, and none of the work that you have seen and that Nura has reported on so far would have ever been possible without government, and I know some government officials from Ethiopia are here, um, and it, has, it would never have been possible to achieve any of this without inserting our work within what government tries to achieve as well. Um, and so we believe that these are important elements of our work and we try and integrate this in other things we do. Now, does that mean that we have the solution and that we can get out there and um, plant NBSs, nature-based solutions, everywhere we want, um, I would be slightly cautious. And I'd like to see the next slide, please. Um, first of all, we find that you can only really work properly with nature in developing countries as long as you insert this work within development programs and within the development journeys of the communities that we work with. And this is long-term work. This takes a long time. It took 20, 25 years for Farm Africa to be where it is in Bali. Um, one step at a time. Um, never rush. Talking to multiple actors, communities, government, local businesses, especially also in different conversations with the donors, getting used to the anthropology of donors, to their new narratives, um, uh, and adjusting the language to what it is they want to do uh, for the money that they entrust us. Um, and it means building trust amongst all of those people. And this takes time and it's not easy and sometimes it fails. But there is a second element to this and that is that it is often assumed that when one works with nature there are automatic benefits for development as well. And this is not necessarily true. There are trade-offs. And Ethiopia is a case in point, because Ethiopia is trying to achieve self-sufficiency in grain production, and there are studies that show that this is not going to be possible by just intensifying production on existing cropland with the existing technologies and existing trends in increased productivity on, on that cropland. Um, so somewhere, somehow, trade-offs have to be made. And when you talk about trade-offs, um, it means that, to some extent, the nature services that we would like to be produced have to somehow be paid for. The communities who provide a nature service to a regional or a global community have to be rewarded for the effort and for the value that they are creating through their efforts. For the moment, we use the carbon markets to reward those efforts. These carbon markets 
are very immature, despite the many years that people have worked on them. They are unstable, they are immature, they are heavily contested, as we all know, um, and they are technologically extremely demanding. Now, um, while we can address some of these technical issues, we cannot address these others. But there is one issue which is much worse than all of these, and that is that the carbon markets are incredibly unfair. A recent study by Mark Carney and by Nick Stern indicated that it costs the global economy $120 uh, for each ton of carbon dioxide that we emit in the, in, the, in, in the atmosphere. For the moment, the carbon markets are paying local communities in Bali between one and a half and three dollar um, uh, for, for the carbon that they are saving for the global community. This market is unfair. Um, so unless we find better ways, clever ways, to reward communities for the environmental services they produce, um, these nature-based solutions will not take off. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nora, and thank you, Ivan, for that really fantastic case study to get us going. Um, I really liked uh, sort of looking at the landscape approach taken in the Bale region, but also what Ivan was saying around you only move at the pace that the community allows you, and it's such an important thing for all of us to remember. I understand that we, we may have an Ethiopian government official here with us in the room, Seyfedan. Would you like to say um, any words, or would you like to speak for a minute about this case study? Okay, okay. So would so no or ah oh, okay in the Q and A of course uh, perfect excellent well we'll welcome you back in the Q and A then thank you very much okay well in that case we'll move on to our second case study it um, if we could go to the next slide that would be fantastic um, so I'd very much like to welcome up Yiching Song who's also presenting on behalf of Yu Fen Chang who she'll talk about in a moment. Yiching is a long-term partner and friend of IIED. We're very proud to work with her. Um, she's also the founder of the Pharmacy Network in China, and she will take us through this fantastic case study now as well. Thank you very much, Yiching. Thank you. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Very happy that to have the chance to share our farmer's voice. And I'm here on behalf of Pharmacy Network. Uh, and then to present the, uh, the cases. My talk is uh, starting from the cases and all the way up to the top policy. So, which I think that both sides are very important. We really think the grassroots case are the root and the base, and the policy are important. That's why we are all here to be, be, make a big change and transformation. Okay, next. Okay, this is our uh, Cases location, you can see that this is four villages. The four villages are trying to link, working together automatically by themselves. They share the same landscape along the Yangtze River, uh, which you can see that is uh, near the uh, southwest part of China, near Tibet. It's in a very beautiful three river, three paralyzed river areas, which is UNESCO natural heritage. At the same time, it's also cultural heritage part. It's by diversity rich places. And then there, these four villages are all located along the Yangtze River bank uh, valley. And they share one uh, ethnic culture called Naxi. Uh, also, some people call them Mosul. So this is the uh, culture they share. Uh, so the approach we're using is by cultural landscape. We, we think that landscape are very, very important, but it's uh, interacted with uh, by culture. Next one. Okay, uh, the two natural resource, key, uh, key natural resources I'm talking here is the first one is water, which are very important for the mountain communities we are working with, this is for common. And there, the, the communities, uh, take the water management as a very crucial part for generations. And the systems they are building also are full of wisdom. Here you can see that they have this uh, kind of irrigation systems from uh, surface and underground to avoid the, uh, uh, the washout and the drought. And this is uh, help them for the big challenges they are facing for climate change. 
because in the last 10, de last 30 decades, this is continually big uh, spring drought in the southwest part of China. Every year, the, the, the first spring rains uh, delay, delay, and delay. So only with this kind of uh, water systems that can help them to manage uh, their communities. And then what the ways of, of them maintaining and manage the uh, water system is uh, through customer laws and uh, through the farmer community themselves. This is the uh, very important heritage irrigation systems they are maintaining. All the four villages they have different uh, uh, water systems, but uh, are all based on their own natural uh, water systems. Next one. Next one. Okay, next one, uh, a natural resource I'm talking about is agro, uh, agro biodiversity, seed, which we discuss with the community, which they consider as a very important agriculture by diverse seed because of the industry agriculture, because of the monocropping. The seed, especially the land races, disappear very, very rapidly. So that's why they try to maintain their own seed and bring back their own seed. And what they said that with seed in hand, security in life. They really have their own seed. They're starting with uh, working with uh, scientists, uh, starting with the participant breeding, and then to do uh, conservation and improvement, and then also establish a community seed bank. The community seed bank is really important for them as a common space to share the common properties, common goods, and then maintaining it. So become a very important mechanism. Next one. Here you can see that the, uh, with this uh, conserved seed and the community seed bank, it's really working. For in this, in last spring, uh, because of severe COVID-19, that is closed down a lot of places in China. The communities are closed down, but those communities who with this seed, we collected cases from all over China that. Uh, they have the community seed bank and they conserve their own seed. They, they manage it to have uh, the spring sowing. Other communities that are, are running short of seed if they, they rely on market. So this is also really a case that is to, 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 uh, to convince that people need their own seed for crisis, for, for changes. Next. But also for this, they also publish a, a draft paper and then together with UNEP, IEMP. So this is a link there. I also have some flyer here later on. If you're interested, I can share with you. Next one. It's not only working, the community seed bank and the farmer conserve their own seed. It's not only working in these uh, remote mountain communities. Actually, farmers' own seed are important for all type of communities who want to help themselves. Only a few years ago, we started this initiative of community seed bank, working with the different communities, and then through training, through a workshop, and automatically, this is community set up in all over China. And now still continue. Farmers, they try, communities, they're trying to establish their own, with, with their own fund. And then even uh, young farmers, new farmers, they started to collect it and doing their own seed. Uh, in, their, in their local communities. So this is very important. And then another important factor of this uh, uh, community seed bank that is that it's important for even for the formal seed systems because the increasing monocropping, increasing uh, breeding, uh, close breeding, the genetical base of breeding become narrow and narrow, especially for, uh, for the uh, several staple food crops, uh, wheat, rice, and uh, 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 and maize. So if we link these community seed banks with gene bank, it really can mutual benefit. Scientists can, can help farmers to improve their uh, local seed, and si uh, local seed can really enrich the formal seed systems. That's why this incentive for formal systems, scientists to work in with communities. So we managed to do this in the last several years in several uh, gene banks in Yunnan and also in Guangxi and in other areas. 
next thank you next one and uh, communities uh, scientists they are working together and then they are not this is not enough we really need to they are there are still limited cases in the big China. The mainstream is still monocropping and uh, industry uh, agriculture. We really need the voice and this kind of action, this kind of collaborations to be seen, to be heard by policy makers, by other civil society actors. So, uh, this year, because the COP, uh, uh, COP15, uh, CBD, COP15 is, uh, was holding in China in the first part. So before that, we have a two pre-COP event uh, supported by the Environment Ministry and Environment uh, uh, Agriculture, uh, organized by Chinese Academy of Science uh, together with the Pharmacy Network. We managed to organize this two uh, pre-COP event together with uh, science, science top scientists in biodiversity and, and, and related uh, dis disciplines with communities. And the one conclusion we have and suggestion we have is that community-based actions are effective, joint effort and recognition and support are urgently needed because community effort and the farmers' effort are not have enough attention in all the biodiversity conservation in the CBD. Okay, next one. Okay, uh, last month in October, you all know that the COP15 first part is hold, was held in, in Kunming. Although there's limited participation there, but uh, we managed to organize a side event, uh, focus on community, scientists, and uh, a, so, a social organization, uh, NGOs, and the policy makers. We managed to, to, to gather them together in Kunming, just uh, side by side with, uh, uh, with the uh, big meetings. And uh, importantly is that uh, there's over uh, 200 participants uh, uh, attended uh, in person, and uh, more than half of them are from communities. And a lot of them from local NGOs who support communities. So they are so happy that they to have this chance to share their voice, to share their action. And fortunately, uh, the executive secretary, uh, Elizabeth Primas, managed to come to our event and give an opening talk about that. She really, really appreciates our community support effort and give a very positive support to, uh, uh, and uh, comments to the, uh, to the uh, event. So, next one. Okay, this is the conclusion. Uh, of all the work we have done, we really think that uh, the action proved to be effective that uh, Bioculture and pharmacy system enhancement are very important. If we talk about the nature, if we talk about the climate change adaptations, that they are doing this every day, like just the previous speaker said, in systems, in communities, and in societies, every day to doing that. So this link to their life, link to their everyday farming. And the second one, that from seat to table actions, uh, because we talk about uh, climate change, we talk about nature, we talk about biodiversity, but people are very important. We, we talk about the people-centered, community-based, natural-based. This is the, all the, because we all, people, we all, everybody eat, and the seed is the starting of the food. So food system is also important. So from sea to table action for resilient food systems, this is what we also focus on. And another one is that uh, the culture, like uh, linking the ancient native wisdoms because of the traditional culture, traditional uh, knowledge are very important to, to, in, to working together with the science. And because this is traditional knowledge and uh, uh, culture, they are living. It's, it's, a, it's, a, uh, it's a living one in the evolution, in the process. Yeah, and at the grassroots level. So it really needs to be re uh, organized, uh, recognized. The last one I want to emphasize here is women. Because of the uh, feminization of agriculture, because of urbanization, a lot of people in the grassroots level, in the remote community, are women. 
So women empowerment for agrobiodiversity, food production, and healthy diet in adaptation to climate change and crisis are very, very important. They are the key in this in the process. Last one. Next one. This is the last of her, uh, the last message I want to pass that we really need to recognize and supporting farm, small farmers and communities, uh, protecting and enhance our root and the base. They really, they are really our root and the base for our common survival and sustainability. We need them to continue. Thank you. Thank you so much, Yu Ching. A very strong call to action there for support for farmers and for communities in tackling the triple crisis. So thank you very much. I particularly liked what you said about um, the communities that had been involved in the project being more resilient or having better access to seeds, etc., through the COVID pandemic. And obviously that's very relevant for us still with the pandemic continuing. Okay. So we started in Ethiopia, we've just been to China, and now we're going to go back to West Africa and uh, have a case study from Mali. So I'd like to introduce up George Bazongo, who's the Director of Operations at TRIA to take us through our final case study for today. Thank you, Boni. Good afternoon, everybody. My name is George Bazongo, or you said I'm Director of Operations at uh, TRIA, based in Ouagadougou. Uh, it's in Burkina Faso in West Africa. So you can see that the weather is not uh, favorable for us, but anyway, we can adapt at any time. Um, I want to present you one of our case study in uh, Burkina, uh, Mali. It's one of our country of operation in dry land of Africa. Uh, it's a community-based dry land ecosystem restoration and tree enterprise uh, development. And why Mali? Because Mali is one of the poorest country in the, in the world. That's important in the dry land Africa. And this community, we support it. 95% uh, of the population are living in a rural area. So basically, they are living by using the natural resources like uh, land, forest, water, and uh, others. And 85% of this community are living under the poverty line. So it means that and most of the poor and vulnerable people are women. It's very important. And also the children under five, the more than 30% are really uh, under malnutrition. And the work we have done, uh, it's through a project funded by Darwin Pro uh, Initiative with we support by the Minister of Environment of uh, Mali, municipalities of Tomia. Tomia is in the region of uh, Sigu, and uh, also by Sahel Eco, which is a local NGO. Because when you work with local communities, it's better to uh, recruit, build the capacity of uh, local knowledge people so that they can easily support and then be accepted also by the local community. Next. So, um, this community, what I said, they usually grow crops every year and animals. So, we are facing the degradation of the land. And also, we have overgrazing, we have a forest, we are cutting the trees, then to feed the animals and then to be able to grow the crops, which accelerate the soil erosion, so degradation, losing uh, fertility, and the productivity also decline. That's very important to you know. So they have to continue to cut the trees and then to be able to grow the, the crops because we need to feed our fami their families and to meet also the family needs in terms of school fees, in terms of houses, in terms of clothes to wear, in terms of health. Uh, issues that's very uh, important. The one of the issue is that through this degradation, we are we move from the forest to the savanna. And when you talk about savanna, it means yearly we have what we call the bushfire, which is very damage for the biodiversity. And then by cutting the trees, also we are losing a lot of species in terms of animal microorganism as well as some trees and grasses. 
And what we do and the solution we provide it is, first of all, to support for uh, tree planting and uh, restoration. So, we support the community by training, support them also to establish uh, what we call uh, local nurseries, managed by the uh, people themselves, the trees they identify, the trees they want to plant because of the need for them. We, need, we know that these communities, they are all involved in uh, NTFP value chain development. So they identify themselves the trees they want to plant. And I have to say that all these activities uh, we apply there are in what we call a forest management plan. And also, we support them in terms of land tenure because we need to secure people who are working there. We need to improve the right of access to the women and all the other people to this forest and forest product. If not, if people are not secure to access to a forest, for sure they will not invest because you can invest today, tomorrow we'll say, okay, please leave there, I have to take my land. So we manage to have all this with the support of the municipalities, uh, Minister of Environment people, even agriculture agent, and then the local communities. Then what you see, this is a training how to plant the trees. And then we restore more than 327 uh, trees. We support also to establish 44 uh, what we call village tree enterprises. Is the process is very simple. The community will sit together, we provide them with technical support, and then we think around what a natural, uh, natural uh, non timber forest product we can have in the environment leaves, nuts, fruit, uh, save, and others. And then we decided to focus on share and honor. And then you are seeing that this lady, she's drying she, some share nuts. Because the potential is really high in this forest. And then also these trees, they need to be protected and restored. Because most of the countries in West Africa, uh, a lot of women are living by processing and marketing some uh, share nuts. And also we support you to have some in this forest to restore 20,000 hectares of land by applying some soil and conservation practices, a stone band and uh, plowing, and also to what we call some semi moon, this over to improve the soil fertility and then to stop the degradation or reduce the degradation of the, the forest and uh, the land. Next. Then, what benefit for the nature, people, and the climate? The nature, what I said, you, you can see that by improving the restoration of 20,000 hectares of land, it means that you improve the biomass, which is very important, and which improve also the tree species. So, by the life of the project, it's increased from 168 trees to 182 species. That's very important. And under these trees, you have a lot of grasses. You have a lot of animals which are coming again. You have the soil fertility, which is really improving. And if the soil fertility improves, we have a, you know, the, the life in the soil now to become. Uh, very important and the microorganism is very important to capture the carbon and the nitrate from the hair and uh, in the soil. And also in terms of uh, nature, we increase the biodiversity from 37 species to 43 uh, species. That is very important for us. In terms of trees, because we did some ecological survey to have this information. For all this, allow the community to support the enterprise's work. You see the lady with the share, she processed it. She has a better and she can sell all of this. So it increased 
the community's overall income by 270%. Because in the past, this component in the household income was really low. But by supporting this, by helping these uh, ladies, women, to access to improve market, to have to put in the market some quality product, it's increased, you know, the income they can have by selling this product, and then for the overall income of a family, which was only focused on crop production. The also income from non tobacco forest also increased by 3% to 26%, and then 34% of the populations down are below the uh, poverty line. So from 85 now we have at 35 percent. So we support you to help 53 percent of this population now to improve their livelihood condition. And all this nature and uh, people improving condition, improving nature, it's now making the communities to cope and to mitigate the climate shock and stresses, I meaning by floods and drought. Because they are able to buy some food, they are able to invest and then also to protect, you know, the land, to cover the land and then to, you know, to mitigate against the uh, heavy rain they can have and not to stop the erosion. To adapt because also with the money they have, they can now, now invest in the forest, and then also to face to the consequences of the climate crisis. So we can see that by promoting the forest, planting and restoring trees, we were able to be to have some positive uh, impact for the nature, for the communities, improving livelihood and the income, and as well as also improving how the communities are able to mitigate and to adapt to the climate uh, crisis. Next. Yes, in terms of a woman, you know, what I said, in, uh, the 44 village enterprises, women are really, uh, we can say, 99% of, uh, of uh, people around. So through some capacity building, organizations, access to market, they were able to improve their voices and to empower their livelihood condition you know, in the communities. And then we are able to access to improve market and then to discuss the needs, you know, among communities and also in the families. Next. Then just this Bernadette, a 47 years old. It's a mother. Now you can see that through all the support around the share enterprise, she were able to increase the unit price, you know, of a kilogram of uh, share better. So if we take the maxi from 300 sefa, now she is around 1,000 sefa. So it means improving quality, improved market, and she is able now to go beyond the village, the common, to have some uh, buyers who can then uh, we are able to provide some good prices for this. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, George. Some really uh, amazing outcomes there for women and for livelihoods um, through this project. And I think what strikes me about all three case studies actually is the, the evidence that shows the impact. Uh, and this is the case through all 13 case studies in the report. And I think often one of the setbacks we hear for willingness to invest in nature-based solutions is the inability to test what the impacts are, to test what the outcomes are. And I think actually what we're seeing here is that it is entirely possible. You just need to really commit to it uh, and do the research and, and you can see the outcomes. So that brings us to the end of our second part of the agenda. Thank you very much again to the three case studies who um, presented to us today. What we're going to do now is to move into a panel discussion. Uh, we have quite a big panel because we're going to bring up all of our speakers um, again, uh, plus an additional speaker. So if I could please invite all of the four plus Nat, so five speakers that have already spoken up onto 
um, the stage. If you could make your way up, that would be fantastic. We'll have to share microphones, um, which I hope is okay for everyone. Thank you. And then once we have everyone settled, Yiching, you're very welcome to stay here if you like. Um, I'd also now like to invite up Alyssa Maria Gomez, who's a climate, chi climate change analyst from the Adaptation Fund. Thank you so much for your time today. Um, Aly Alyssa is joining us for the policy discussion component here. We were also um, intending to be joined by a representative from the Swedish uh, International Development Agency, but they were not able to join us, so uh, they send their apologies. But nonetheless, I'm going to hand over first to Elisa to provide some reflections on what she's heard, um, some perspectives from the Adaptation Fund, and then we'll get into a discussion amongst Elisa and, and Nat and all of our speakers here today. And then we will also invite up our um, Ethiopian government official to um, make some remarks or, or ask some questions as well if he likes. So Elisa, I'll, I'll turn to you first. Thanks a lot, Ebony. Really happy to be here and to hear from the experiences of all our excellent speakers. Um, to give you a brief overview of the Adaptation Fund for those that are not familiar with the fund, the Adaptation Fund was established to finance concrete adaptation projects and programs in developing parties to the Kyoto Protocol. And as of 2019, the fund has been serving the Paris Agreement Numerous adaptation fund projects use ecosystem-based approaches that fall under the overarching umbrella of nature-based solutions. And they help uh, to tackle climate change, benefit vulnerable communities, and improve livelihoods while protecting and restoring ecosystems. I'd like to highlight that the fund's strategic focus on people, livelihood, and ecosystems is well aligned with the interconnected nature of nature-based solutions. And this approach then focuses on protecting, sustainably managing, and restoring ecosystems. I'd like to share a few insights from the fund's portfolio. Um, and this is probably aligned with some of the points that have already been talked about here today. Uh, firstly, um, it's important to note that site-specific vulnerabilities of countries require locally driven approaches and locally driven solutions. The Adaptation Fund has endorsed the eight principles of locally-led adaptation and aligned with this um, is the idea uh, that NBS is often aligned with local systems and it's important that you work within the traditional government systems as well. For example, our project in the Federated States of Micronesia uh, understood that uh, the traditional governance system in, in Koh Sarai is a centralized system, whereas in, in another island, in Yap, it's a decentralized system. And so in, in the implementation of the small grants projects worked within that traditional system. Another important point to raise is linking uh, traditional ecological knowledge or tech um, with, uh, with, with, our, with our modern knowledge and a project in Indonesia that's being implemented by the Government and Partnership Reform Organization of Indonesia is linking satellite remote sensing uh, data along with uh, the traditional Sasi Laut system of governing marine resources. And this project focuses on restoring the coastal ecosystems. Um, another um, important element to point out is that um, in the design of projects, uh, it's, important to, um, it's important to address location barriers and language barriers. Um, it's important that these aspects are budgeted early on in the projects and um, to ensure that nobody's left behind. And um, related to this is the important point on safeguards. Um, I cannot highlight more the importance of, ally of, of ensuring that all um, environmental and social safeguards are taken into consideration, ensuring that, and this helps safeguard against maladaptation um, and, um, and also other elements such as the risk of introducing invasive species and environments, and we've talked about this earlier as well. Um, 
then when it comes to um, local and national and regional cooperation, the Adaptation Fund has a number of regional projects as well. For example, our project in the Lake Victoria Basin recognized the interconnected and interdependent nat nature um, of the basin ecosystem, whereby changes in one area could impact the overall functioning and provisioning of ecosystem services in other areas. And uh, for successful potential replication of nature-based solutions, um, it's important that uh, it, it's it's important to ensure that the policy and regulate, regulatory environments are in, aligned with. So this means that in the project formulation, we're looking for projects that are aligned with national priorities and strategies to ensure that these successful approaches are embedded then in these uh, in these systems. And um, a point that we that talked about briefly, and I think Pharma Africa raised this very eloquently about the long time span of nature-based solutions. And so it's important to balance the needs between short and medium term needs. And um, our project in Cambodia, for example, has livelihood diversification activities along with the restoration efforts that take a long time uh, to see benefits. Um, and um, in the governance arrangements at a local level um, involving women's organizations and women's groups in the activities is something that's an extreme is a priority for the fund and uh, this is also in line with our gender policy and action plan um, finally, financial mechanisms. I think we talked about this briefly as well. Um, and these are key to ensuring sustainability um, and also ensuring the, the buy-in from local communities, such as payment for ecosystem services. Uh, these are something that, um, that's, that's, uh, that's in a number of the AF-funded projects. Uh, for example, um, a project in Honduras uh, where community members and local foresters are encouraged to adopt sustainable forest management practices and restoration activities um, in exchange for access to water and irrigation facilities that are part of the project. Um, so sometimes um, nature-based solutions, um, you know, n uh, natural processes are accompanied by small infrastructure activities, whether it is building a dam, a, a small check dam, or maybe uh, it's a water harvesting system that's being, that's being developed as part of the project. Um, and finally, um, a last point before we kickstart the discussion is the importance of partnerships. Ensuring that ecosystems are connected um, and you're looking at a number of di different ecosystems that link together. And so it's important to ensure that all stakeholders are involved in the planning process. This is involving local communities, civil society organizations, but as well as re relevant government uh, and, 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 and local government partners in the process. Um, with that, I end my intervention and uh, over to you, Ebony. Thank you so much, Alyssa. That was so insightful and, and just really exciting to hear that uh, the Adaptation Fund is taking such an interest in nature-based solutions uh, and particularly in, ter in terms of involving the local level. I think if we have time, I have lots of questions for you actually, but we may, we may in fact run out of time. Um, but what I would like to do now is just to mention that we will have time probably for one or two questions from the floor and also virtually, if you're joining us from the virtual world, please do pop your questions into the chat and we will um, ask them on your behalf. Before we get into the q and I would very much like to invite up Safer Din to say a few words um, from the Ethiopian government. Would you like to come up here? Thank you very much. Hello, everybody. First of all, I'd like to say thank you for all presenters. I'm really grateful for, to Farm Africa for arranging this important discussion, especially to share uh, different experiences in different countries. With the context to climate resilient green economy strategy, Ethiopia is committed to reduce greenhouse emission through deforestation and forest degradation and uh, through implementing different strategies, especially by uh, through implementing su successful implementation of integrated watershed management for over 10 years, and also of, on massive afforestation through Green Legacy Program, which was implemented 
in the last three years. This, is, this was undertaken through mass mobilization of the uh, local community. As a result, the forest cover of our region, as well as the country as a whole, is highly improved. On the other hand, in participatory forest management approach, uh, uh, which, which is implementing uh, in, in our region, uh, the role of Farm Africa is very high, uh, very high. With this effort made, deforestation of natural forest is significantly reduced. With the help of this organization, we have uh, effecting emission reduction purchase agreement for the sale of uh, Bali Eco region, from which we gained very good experience. Uh, our forest cooperative have also been benefited from uh, the sale of uh, the, this uh, emission reduction. And uh, also the pressure on the uh, forest is highly reduced due to uh, the, uh, this. As Nura indicated in his presentation, farmers living around the forest are uh, majorly very poor and they uh, depend mainly on forest for their livelihood, just like a like, uh, 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 collection of firewood and also making charcoal and etc. Looking for alternative livelihood option is very important as uh, Farm Africa is still doing. The other issue is uh, what I want to bring to attention is uh, for those private owners who purchase our carbons, uh, uh, not only the, 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 the money from the uh, purchase of carbon are not only saving the forest, but also supporting the livelihood of the poor around the, uh, the uh, forest. The pilot project tested uh, on Bali uh, ecoregion is now extended to all over the Oromia region uh, through uh, off-lap project, uh, off -lap, off -lap program supported by World Bank, which is landscape-based project. And uh, we are looking to achieve emission reduction of nearly 45 million ton equivalent, uh, carbon equivalent in the coming eight years, which is very significantly high. Uh, finally, I appreciate effort from Farm, Farm Africa uh, in this regard, especially in seeking nature-based solution for climate change and uh, ask usual cooperation to support us in implementation of this solution through conserving ecosystem and biodiversity, especially in the hot spot areas uh, uh, of the region. And also, we, uh, I want to ask support in linking us with more buyers of emission reduction. Uh, uh, we have made so far, and also we are going to make in the coming eight years. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Seyfuddin. It's so fantastic um, to see that relationship between the national government and um, people doing nature-based solutions and even more exciting to hear that it's being scaled up and rolled out. So that's really, uh, really wonderful. And thank you very much for your time and for joining us today. Um, folks, we are almost out of time. We do have a couple of minutes though for a question or two from the audience. Um, is there anyone who has a question? I can see a couple of hands going up. Um, yes, over here. Maybe if we take um, this question here at the front and then one at the back and then we will ask the panel to respond and then we'll close out. If you could just introduce yourself and your affiliation as well, if you're comfortable, that'd be great. Thank you. Um, Cécile Girardin from Nature Based Solutions Initiative. Um, uh, so this week we've seen so many announcements and pledges on funding and public funding and private funding. And, uh, and first, I'd like to thank the panel for these amazing presentations. Thank you, and for the years and years of work that have gone behind this, of course. And um, I'm just wondering if you would have, if, how you, if you have ideas on how you would like to, what you'd like to see to ensure that this finance goes to the communities that really need it. Because I know, and there, there has been a lot of discussion around um, 
the, uh, the lack of direct access to these funds and how, how does that work in practice? Amazing, thank you. It's a really important question. Was there a second question at the back? Yeah, if we can take that one, we'll take both together and then we'll do swift responses from the panel. Um, please, over to you. Thank you. Um, my name is Jan Brook. I um, run the Marrakesh Partnership Initiative Navigating a Changing Climate, so I'm working with the navigation sector. And we are actually tomorrow um, launching another pledge, this time on sediment management, but very much in the context of nature-based solutions. So the role that sediments play in uh, supporting habitats. Um, so I'm a little bit curious from Natalie's presentation. I had a, a very specific question. Am I right that you're looking only for conservation organisations to sign your pledge? Ah, OK. So it's missing because we're looking tomorrow for all kinds of organisations, including those that are delivering. So, so developers, industrial sectors and others. And, and I, I thought you said about conservation and research, and I was like, well, those aren't necessarily the people that deliver some of these things, and we need to get everybody engaged rather than just a subset. So maybe that was just a misunderstanding. Thank you very much. Nat, do you want to take that question quickly and then we'll go... I'll just take, yeah, please. I'll just take that question very quickly. What it is is we want the guidelines to be signed by those with, um, with understanding of the validity of those that have the authority to say, yes, we know from our experience that these four guidelines make sense. So they can be implementers that are gathering evidence on the effectiveness of those. What we didn't want the guidelines to be used for was greenwashing. So we didn't want everybody, consultants, private organisations that were, were, weren't, didn't necessarily have that. We didn't, didn't have the capacity to, to, to vet those types of signatories. But any organisation from the development, world of development, world of conservation, world of research, who, who has the authority to say, yes, we think these are good, very, very robust guidelines based on experience are welcome to sign. I hope, that's, I hope that's clearer. Thank you. And we are basically out of time. I wanted to see if any of our case study speakers would like to answer the first question around, um, around accessing funds to support nature-based solutions. Ivan, please go for it. Um, I'm, I'm sure our colleague from the Adaptation Fund can say much more about direct access. Um, uh, having been, having had the satisfaction of joining the Adaptation Fund at the beginning to help set up direct access, uh, it's a pleasure to see where it's got to, um, and uh, it's really lovely. So, so I leave the direct access question there. But I, I think the 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 key to the answer to your question, I think, is in is in the definition of nature-based solutions. Now, we we have to be very careful with this. These are the solutions to what problem and whose problem. Um, so the way they are currently being sold and taunted is as the solution to the climate crisis. They are largely taunted as a solution to the problem that rich countries cannot, for the moment, uh, afford to reduce fossil fuel uh, uh, emission um, uh, production and so therefore need to try and solve this through an, an assistance from nature. This, this is the logic for nature-based solutions. But when we look at this from a developing country development perspective, there is a very different story to tell. And this is nature-based solutions to the problems of the developing countries and nature-based solutions to the problems of the communities who we are working with. And it's only when we start working there and we start building alliances between these two problem areas that we will find negotiated agreements. Money will have to play a role. Thanks, Ivan. I actually think that's a really fantastic note to end on, and I'm sorry that we don't have more time to engage in discussions with the panel members. We do have an event coming in here now. Um, can everyone please join me in thanking the speakers today for their time, for their experience, for their wisdom. It's so fantastic to bring us all together. We are going to be around, so if you have questions for any of the speakers, please do come and ask them after the event. As we all pack up and, and move out of this space, we're going to play another song from the youth choir that we heard from at the beginning. This is called SOS from the Kids. Uh, and everyone, thank you very much for joining. Thank you to those joining us virtually as well. And we look forward to seeing you soon. Bye.